It's Tuesday, August 22nd, 2023. And this is Uranium Spotlight, your weekly podcast dedicated to delivering the latest news and events shaping the uranium fuel market and its critical role in the global energy landscape. Brought to you by PurePoint Uranium Group, trading on the TSX Venture and the OTCQB. PurePoint actively operates a portfolio of advanced uranium projects in the world's richest uranium district and has established partnerships with some of the largest uranium suppliers worldwide. While our passion for this subject is undeniable, it's essential to clarify that the information presented here is not investment advice. Instead, our goal is to offer an unbiased and comprehensive review of recent events that could impact uranium pricing. And now your host, Chris Frostad. In this week's Uranium Spotlight, we look at changing policies affecting the world's shift to nuclear power and the increasing investments being made in support of the sector. We'll also take a look at new advances in the rollout of small nuclear reactors, but first, uranium prices. The uranium spot price rose $1.25 last week to close at $58.25 per pound U308. Activity in the spot market exhibited a noticeable rise last week with considerable buyer engagement through brokers and off-market channels. Throughout the third week of August, there were nine spot transactions totaling approximately 1.1 million pounds of U308. The market initially saw quiet trading at the beginning of the week, but activity picked up on Tuesday, resulting in four transactions being awarded over those two days. This upturn prompted an upward shift in pricing, as evidenced by a deal on Wednesday elevating the daily indicator to $57.15 per pound. Additional demand emerged later in the week, with three more transactions on Thursday propelling the daily spot indicator to $57.85 per pound. This upward trend pushed the indicator to a 16-month peak of $58.25 per pound by week's end. The transaction data points to a shift towards prompt demand interest, as all nine deals involve zero- to three-month delivery periods. Furthermore, prices for near-term delivery at key providers Cameco, Converdine, and Orano all converged to the same elevated level of $58.25 per pound, reflecting a competitive market landscape. In the recent week, the term uranium market saw limited activity without new demand or contract awards. However, multiple utilities appear poised to enter the market before October, pursuing deals via various approaches, including off-market talks and RFP preparations. Last week, we saw a number of regulatory adjustments in the nuclear space out of Sweden, the U.S., and China. Sweden is set to lift its ban on uranium mining in order to expand its nuclear energy capacity, driven by plans to construct 10 large reactors over the next two decades. Sweden's climate minister noted majority parliamentary support for the ban's removal. Previously an anti-nuclear country, Sweden now aims to double electricity production with nuclear power's reduced environmental impact. In the United States, the Biden administration has tightened export controls on nuclear power materials and components to China, aiming to ensure their peaceful use and prevent proliferation of nuclear weapons. The Bureau of Industry and Security and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission now demand specific licenses for exporting generators, containers, software, and special nuclear materials. The move reflects strained U.S.-China relations with concerns over spying, human rights, and technology export bans. While viewed as symbolic, the change signals increased scrutiny on China's nuclear intentions. China, having protested, claimed commitment to non-proliferation, but criticized geopolitical interests over nuclear efforts. During Illinois' upcoming six-day veto session, the state's energy policies, specifically the possibility of ending the decades-old moratorium on new nuclear power facilities, will be a key focus for legislators. Governor Pritzker vetoed a measure aiming to lift the moratorium, citing last-minute changes before its passage in the spring. The debate involves separating the development of large-scale reactors from small modular reactors. While Pritzker's veto reasoning was criticized by Senate Majority Leader John Curran, the bipartisan measure aimed at controlling rising energy costs amid renewable energy mandates gained veto-proof majorities. The session begins on October 24, and requires a three-fifths vote in both chambers to override a veto. Countries around the world are investing heavily in new nuclear reactors. Poland, China, Kazakhstan, and North Carolina are all looking at building their first nuclear power plant or expanding their nuclear fleets. 
China is set to invest $31.8 billion in new nuclear power plants by 2025, aligning with its development strategy for the sector. The China Center for Energy Economics Research reported the investment covers the entire six to seven year construction phase and associated industries. China had 53 operational nuclear plants at the end of 2022, accounting for 2.2% of its power capacity. Although nuclear energy constituted just 5% of its power mix, it's noted that China's Hulong-1 nuclear reactor is globally operational, and a multifunctional modular reactor installed in Hainan holds export potential. A joint venture of Polish firm ZEPAC and Polska Grupa has applied for approval from Poland's Ministry of Climate to build a nuclear power plant in the Patno Konin region. The proposal entails Korean supplied APR 1400 reactors and aligns with Poland's coal reduction strategy. The decision in principle represents state endorsement for the investment, allowing the companies to progress with construction licensing. The project aims to start the first reactor by 2033 and establish subsequent units every two to three years, contributing to Poland's emission reduction goals. In November 2022, Westinghouse's AP-1000 design was chosen for Poland's inaugural nuclear plant. Duke Energy Carolinas and Duke Energy Progress propose extending the lifespan of their existing nuclear plants and constructing two new small modular reactors by 2035 in an integrated resource plan aimed at achieving carbon neutrality by 2050. The plan outlines four portfolios focusing on carbon reduction targets through different pathways by 2030 or 2034. Portfolio 3 emphasizes nuclear energy as a bedrock assumption, alongside hydrogen-capable natural gas resources, energy storage, and small modular reactors. The proposal highlights nuclear's role in achieving carbon neutrality and underlines the necessity of at least 570 megawatts of new nuclear capacity to be installed by 2035. Finally, Kazakhstan's Minister of Energy announced progress last week on its first nuclear power plant construction, selecting Ulkan in the Zambic region as the plant's location, shortlisting potential suppliers including China National Nuclear Corporation, Korea Hydro and Nuclear Power, Rosatom, and EDF. The Interdepartmental Commission for Nuclear Development approved Ulkan's suitability, but construction requires local agreement, mandated by Kazakhstan's nuclear energy law. Public hearings will assess local opinions on the nuclear plant as mandated by the Ecological Code. Kazakhstan, a leading uranium producer, currently lacks nuclear generation capacity, with its last BN-350 fast reactor ceasing operation in 1999. Last week saw major progress in the development of small modular reactors, primarily in the United States. TerraPower has acquired land for its natrium reactor demonstration project, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission is issuing a rule on small modular reactor emergency preparedness, and a data center in Virginia announced plans to utilize small modular reactors for its future power needs. Terra Power has acquired land in Cameron, Wyoming for its natrium reactor demonstration project. The natrium technology and advanced nuclear reactor and energy storage system will be the first commercial reactor in Wyoming. The project, a public-private partnership under the U.S. Department of Energy's Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program, will validate the design and operational features of the Natrium Reactor, featuring a 345-megawatt sodium-cooled fast reactor with a molten salt-based energy storage system. The energy storage will enable integration with renewables, and the project is expected to create jobs and provide clean, reliable power. The U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission has authorized its staff to issue a final rule and accompanying regulatory guide for emergency preparedness requirements targeting small modular reactors. This rule, expected to be effective within 30 days of being published in the Federal Register, builds upon the NRC's existing emergency preparedness program for large light water cooled nuclear power plants. The rule adopts a technology inclusive and consequence oriented approach aiming to establish a performance-based emergency preparedness program as an alternative to current off-site radiological emergency planning requirements. The rule applies to small modular reactors and non-light water reactors, among other technologies. Finally, Green Energy Partners and IP3 International are collaborating on the Surrey Green Energy Center, a 641-acre industrial park in Virginia. 
The site close to the Surrey power station aims to host data center operators powered by traditional utility during the first phase. But in the second phase, however, they plan to establish small modular nuclear reactors on the site to power data centers, assuming regulatory approval. In company news, NextGen Energy Limited has marked a significant milestone for its Rook One project by completing the Provincial Environmental Assessment Technical Review process and submitting the final Provincial Environmental Impact Statement to the Saskatchewan Ministry of Environment. The Rook One project, situated in Saskatchewan's uranium-rich Athabasca Basin, encompasses both underground and surface facilities aimed at uranium ore mining and processing from the aero deposit. This achievement comes after the Ministry of Environment confirmed the revised conformity review, moving the environmental assessment process to the upcoming 30-day public review phase, scheduled to start by September 2. CEO Lee Cryer emphasized the collaborative efforts with Indigenous communities and various stakeholders, which contributed to this significant step in the project's regulatory advancement. The successful consent from local Indigenous groups is highlighted as a cornerstone achieved through industry-leading benefit arrangements that secure their support throughout the project's lifespan. Simultaneously, NextGen is actively addressing federal technical and public review comments received during the federal environmental assessment review process completed in late 2022. The provincial and federal environmental assessment processes work in tandem to ensure compliance with the unique requirements of each jurisdiction. As NextGen focuses on securing a federal license and supporting Canada's clean energy transition, the company's commitment to responsible development and meaningful consultation remains paramount. And that wraps up your Uranium Spotlight coverage for this week. For more news and events from the world of uranium, please tune in next week to Uranium Spotlight. You've been listening to Uranium Spotlight, your weekly podcast dedicated to delivering the latest news and events shaping the uranium fuel market and its critical role in the global energy landscape. Brought to you by PurePoint Uranium Group, advancing its position as the premier uranium explorer in the world's richest uranium district. Join us again next week for Uranium Spotlight. 